Um, I knew I was a writer when I was very young. Like I always, I don't remember when I started writing. I started reading, um, it was in a bio, I was four when I started reading and I've always been an avid reader and always had a notebook. Like some girls wanted Barbies and I wanted notebooks and pens. That was the only gift that I wanted. Um, so I've been writing forever. When I was in the eighth grade, we had this, um, that the teacher you were talking about, Mr. Thurman, we had an assignment to continue the diary of Anne Frank. Who had read that in middle school? Yeah. Right? So it ends kind of like open. You don't know what happens to Anne Frank and her family. And so um, our teacher gave us the assignment to continue Anne Frank's story. And so I wrote this like 50 page, it, it was a three page assignment. Mine was like 50 pages. <laughs> and um, he said, just at the top, of course, I always got an A in English. If it was any class, I was going to get an A in. Now, geometry, that's nothing. But English, <laughs> I had A's. And so he wrote, you are, and he, and he underlined R, a writer. Um, he just passed away um, late last year. But really, it's teachers, librarians are so, um, you know, they, they inspire young writers. And so, yeah. So that's when I, I knew, I already knew. But it was confirmation. Cool. All right, Kiki. Well, did you write it? How old? And what made you want to be it? My first manuscript was completed while I was in prison when I was doing five years in a federal prison. And what inspired me to do that was um, Terry McMillan. You know, um, she came out with the book Disappearing Eyes. Yeah. And when I read that, I um, followed up. Like I think it was my book. Essence, you know, it was an Ebony magazine, and it was floating around the prison, and I got, I got a hold of it, and I used to read how they did an uh, intimate interview with her, and I'll never forget, she said, when she went to the mailbox and, and pulled out a $45,000 check, I was like, what? <laughs> she got a $45,000 check? I was like, okay, I'm in, I'm in prison, but you know, um, you know, traffic and drugs, and, and I used to make that type of money. I'm like, so I can come over and be legit and do that. And so that's what happened. That's what happened. Wow. So look at the difference here. You have somebody that uh, almost felt like she was born to write. Right? Mm -hmm. So those of you that love English and all that, but then you have somebody that didn't know that she could be a writer, but was inspired by the money, yeah. honey. Yeah. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. So um, that would lead me to uh, you kind of have to share what inspired you, right? And it sounds like your inspiration really came from reading other books, right? Regardless of where you ended, how you ended up writing, your inspiration started out really in your love for reading other books. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, you both read, well, yours was Anne Frank. That wasn't really read by an African American. No, that was school. That was school. <laughs> but <laughs> yours was African American. So now, what motivates you currently to continue to write? What motivates you? So, for me, I just, I love it. I love telling stories. Um, writing is something that I would do if there wasn't a check. Now, I'm happy for the check. We don't get the check. Yeah, I'm happy for it. But writing is just something that I organically do. Um, I don't, I don't, it, it's a release for me. Um, I work out issues through writing. Um, it's cathartic, cathartic for me. So that is just something that I, I do. That's what inspires me to continue. Now what inspires me to continue in this book industry, thank you, is um, it's, it's hard to be inspired in the current state of the you know, literary industry right now. Um, and it's very difficult to stay inspired to keep pushing out books for the market. Um, but I will never stop writing. Like that is just who I am. I'm a storyteller by nature. Kiki, what motivates you? Tell the truth. Yeah. 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 Well, I wouldn't say in the beginning, you know, um, like what you said. Um, it was cathartic. Mm. Cathartic. Mm. I'm going to so, 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 Yeah. yeah. 
Um, my thing is this. Um, I started doing it when I heard someone say, oh my God, girl, you know the critical was the bomb. It was so good. And I and when I heard that, I'm like, okay, I might have something good here. You know, and then um, you know, like you were saying, Carol, my first book, it was called Bad Shambles, and when I came home from prison, I self-published it. And I did it because I read about, you know, um, Elin Harris, he did the same thing. And it was, a, um, a, what is his name, Omar Tyree, he did the same thing. So that was what was going on back then. And, and because I had a burning tale, it was hard, and because I was a self-published author, it was hard to get into the, you know, the stores. You know, so just, to, I was frustrated one day because I couldn't get in the store. And then the very next day I'm excited and, and I'm revved up because someone said, oh my God, girl, you write really well. Mm. So what kept me doing that was the encouragement that I got from readers. Oh, absolutely. You know, so that's what it was for me. And then when I um, did a book signing at a black-owned bookstore with the book that I self-published, he said, the guy, he said, his name was Andre Felton. I was in New Jersey, I'll never forget this. And he says, Kiki, you did time in prison, right, for drugs. I was like, yeah, you know, I just got the drugs. And he said, why don't you write a book about that? He said, because at this particular time, so the sister soldier was out, and then Terry Woods, she was really hot on the scene with True to the Game. And I was like, you know what, I can do that. And that's how I came up with the title Wifey, because I, and Wifey is basically semi-biographical of my life. So that's what I did, and, and when that came out, and I saw the response that I got from it, that also inspired me to continue to write. So that's, it, was, it was a process. So now Wifey is a, a web series, internet web series? Ooh. What's, is it gonna be? What's the script? <laughs> okay. So I used to do a lot of terrible things when I was like 15, 16 years old. So before I was arrested and, and was charged with a federal crime, I was 20 years old. So prior to that, I used to, you know, I don't judge me. When you got to this is a So I used to, you know, yeah, boots clothes. Um, I used to do a lot of crazy stuff. And, and I started meeting drug dealers in the neighborhood. They're like, hey, you know, I'm trying to sell them clothes and they want to, you know, get me. I'm like, I don't want to get with you. I'm trying to sell these clothes that you got. So they're like, you know, you, you can make really, real good money. So that's when I started, you know, trafficking the drugs. Long story short, wifey became a huge success. Like I've sold over a million point two of that series. But like I was saying prior, Part one was based on my life. Part two through five was all fiction. Mm -hmm. So I have a series out right now called How I Became Wifey. Mm -hmm. And it's about me doing crazy things before I met the guy that I went to prison with because it was a whole ring of us. Mm -hmm. So the web series that you see at the end of every incident or story that I'm telling on that series I have a positive message at the end. Wow. Yeah. So it's like a, it's, it's a web series and it's like five to seven minutes per episode. I have three episodes up there so far. But the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm trying to first, you know, let people know that you can get a second chance because, you know, I was in prison for five years and I came home and it was a struggle trying to get back on my feet. But I did that web series because I want people to say, you know, she did this, you know, and look at her now, she's successful, yeah. you know. And I also did that to build awareness around, this happened to me, but it may not happen to you. You know, you might be killed or go to jail, right. so that's why I did how I became one of you. So a lot of our uh, audience wants to be writers. How many want to be writers? They want to write a book. Good, good portion of them. Yeah. Um, and there's some, uh, uh, I learned something here today that um, when it comes to publishing, when you talk about publishing, you self-publish. Did you self-publish? 
So I'm a hybrid author. What does that mean? So, okay. So a hybrid author is somebody who is published with a publisher. So I'm with uh, Dafina, so Kiki and I publish with the same publisher. But then I also self-publish um, e-books primarily. Um, so dabble, you know, a bit in both worlds. And I've seen success in both. Um, so I like self-publishing. I've actually done some print books, um, you know, independently. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And um, because I have a full-time job and I have children and a husband, it's it becomes a whole other thing. Like, if, if you're going to self-publish and do it uh, successfully, you have to put the time in. It's just like a, a nine to five job. You have to get up. You have to make sure you're um, promoting. You have to make sure you've got that distribution in place. It's a, it's you're doing everything yourself, um, and so it is a lot of work. But it just like anything that's a lot of work. That's where you get you know the most success when you put the work in. Um, when I publish with Kensington, I'm only getting a fraction of what I could get if I sold those same books myself, so. Wow. So what would it take to become a writer? So let's start with you, Patricia. When you decided you wanted to write, and you did your book, and you, of course, you self-published, what was the process you went through? Okay. Um, when I went out there and did it myself, I, do, I also do it now, too, like um, Tiffany. Um, I have a publishing company, and um, and the the groundwork is kind of different because back in the day, there were a lot um, there weren't a lot of um, authors. Now the industry is saturated, you know, with a lot of authors. You know, like your aunt could wake up tomorrow, she could publish a book, and she'll have one. Really good editor, and don't just go with the first person you see because they say they're an editor. You know, do some background work, you know, um, get references, you know, and then after you do that, you get in touch with a um, a graphic designer that can get you a very nice cover. Yes. And they're all over Facebook, but there are some really like I know a couple of really good uh, graphic designers. So you get your book um, cover done. Um, sometimes it's like. Um, 150, 250 per book cover. You have to get an ISEN number and and um, a barcode for the book. It has to have a barcode with the USA price tag in Canada. No outlet like Amazon is going to take your book that doesn't have a barcode because they have to keep track of yourselves. Um, and then, like I said, back to the editing. Once you get your book edited properly, um, what you can do is um, give it to a couple of proofreaders first. Because a lot of different eyes is better than just one. Um, you may also, um, and whoever you get to read your book to proofread it, you know, make sure they're giving you criticism, whether it's positive or negative. Like yeah. You need to hear both. Well, I, I think this, you know, I think this ending was, um, I knew it was coming. It, it, it wasn't a surprise. Um, you may have to change, you know, a couple of things in the book, but it's okay because you want it. Don't get attached to it and say, oh, this is my baby. She doesn't know what I'm talking about. You know, don't do that. Just listen to the feedback. If you want to take it, take it, use it. After you get all of that done, that same graphic designer, who did your cover can typeset your book, put it in book form, and it has to be in a PDF file where it cannot be changed. And then you upload your book cover and your manuscript to the printer who's going to print your book. And that's how you do it. Now, she just gave y'all the whole process. Like, that was a whole self publishing plan. <laughs> now, when it's there, okay, so it's there, a particular software that you to when you're writing. So nowadays, I know I have like voice recorder on my phone, on my phone I can voice record. I mean, what product, what do you do? And, and is it your software you use? Do you use Julia Word, you know, Microsoft Word? So for me, when I, because I do primarily ebooks if I'm gonna do them independently. Um, I do put the manuscript in Word, but there's um, a website called smashwords.com. 
and they have a style guide. And if you follow their style guide when you're formatting it, when you upload it um, to Amazon, to Barnes & Noble, to Kobo, it will look correct. Um, so that's what I, I am cheap, y'all. <laughs> I am. I, now I will pay someone to do a content edit and a proofread because that is important. You cannot have typos. I write pretty clean after writing for years and years, but I still need somebody to look at it. Um, so I'm, no matter how many books I write, there are typos. Every time I turn it in, I'm like, okay. So that, for me, using smash words is cheap. Um, there are places where you can um, find discount book covers. Now, I like to find a graphic arts person and a graphic designer and do a real book cover. Like, your book cover should look like books you see in the store. If your book cover looks like your grandbaby did it, <laughs> readers are not going to pick it up. The, the book cover is what draws folks in. Yes. Um, but there are ways that you can find designers that can do it. You know, affordable. I use sometimes if it's just a short story or, or, or a quick book, I use Fiverr.com. I have my own designer on Fiverr that I use, and I can I purchase my own um, graphic off of us. Uh, one of those stock photo, like I use Shutterstock for the most part. I buy my photo off of Shutterstock, give it to my designer on um, uh, Fiverr.com, and I have a book cover in about 48 hours, and I spend 50 bucks on it. But that's not something that I'm going to sell in a store. Like, it's just for, you know, online. So the graphic can be, a, it doesn't have to be as high definition because when you want it in print, there are certain specifications that you have to, um, that you have to do and, and keep, keep I hope y'all was taking notes. Right. Um, so as far as self-publishing goes with, I'm sorry, I done got away from the question. No, 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 you didn't but, answer the question. But yeah, so it's, that's, I don't use software per se. I know some people use um, software to kind of um, plot out their books. I don't use any of that. I'm what you call a pantser. That means I write by the seat of my pants. Um, the only time that I ever outline, I'm serious. I, I only outline if I get stuck or if, you know, I, I rarely get right. That's outside. surprising, Miss English person. I know. I know. Yeah. But I don't outline my books. I just go. Wow. And I go where the inspiration leads me. And so for me, that's why I need a content edit because I might have started a storyline and then just <laughs> dropped it. And my editor would be like, well, what happened to that? I said, oh, I, I decided to take that out. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't do outlines unless I get stuck. My editor, this is a funny thing that they do. They will ask me for an outline. You know this, Kiki. They will ask me for an outline, and then they will create this book cover and the back cover matter based on my outline. I keep telling them, stop doing that, because my stuff is going to change. By the time you get the manuscript back, what you wrote on the back of the book is wrong. So now um, I'm giving them like very vague things to put on. I, this book is going to kind of be about this, and I know I can stick to that. But um, yeah, so I don't do software, really. So what advice would you give our audience here who wants to be writers? What advice would you give? You will um, write as much as possible. And what I mean by that is, I've had people come to me and say, um, I want to write a book. And then I'm like, OK, what do you want to write about? And they'll say, all my life. And that's the answer I get every single time I ask them. And every we do, every one of us has a story. Yeah. But not everything. Um, we we be like a, readers by the excitement. So I'm not gonna want to read your book and you're telling me um, how you planted your flowers one day because I don't do that. I don't plant flowers. So I my advice to you guys is to pull, and you can get a journal, but pull all the interesting things that, all the drama, you know, because drama sells. So that's what we want to, we, we want to read drama. So the, the most significant thing that has happened in your life, I think you, you need to put that in your story. So you need to highlight the things that happened. And then, you know, while you have, and like she said, an outline, let's just say chapter 12, you know, we want to write about 
I, I killed my husband. But up until that point, I want to, I want to talk about what led up to that. So you will have an idea of what you want to write, but how did you, how did it lead up to you stabbing him? Right. You know, what, what was you She gave me all punch now. She right. all punch. Hey, okay, look. What led up to that? Right. What were you, you know, thinking? So yeah. you, you're, you're planting flowers. That has nothing to do with killing him. Unless you was dead. Oh, we can't. 
It's fun to deal with, and I'm trying to address this with you ladies. Um, bad relationships. Yep. The <laughs> foolish husband. Yeah. <laughs> the strength of a black woman.
romance slam jam. Who goes to slam jam? Anybody in here? Um, I go to RT, and there are a lot of romance readers who like my books, but they want more romance. They want, they want the heat. They want, you know, the man to sweep the woman off her feet. This is not that book, right? <laughs> so I wanted to kind of give them it's some real, of that. real romance. <laughs> I wanted to give them some of that, but. Then my contemporary mainstream women's fiction writer kicked in and I have to dangle my characters off the cliff. I have to make life rough because like Kiki said, drama is what people want to read. Yes. Who watches Real Housewives of Atlanta? Anybody in the room? Okay, like, so that's one of my favorite shows that is my guilty pleasure and I don't care what anybody says about me for loving Real Housewives of Atlanta. And so the thing about it is, if they're not arguing, if there's not drama, it's boring, right? So I dangle my characters off the edge. I will, you know, make someone sick. I will have someone be unfaithful because if you're, if you want to happily ever, ever after, you know, it, that takes work. It, happily ever after doesn't just happen when you say I do and you have your first kiss or close the bedroom door. Happily ever after takes work. And so um, for me, I wanted them to, I wanted to see if their love really could conquer all. And to be honest, I didn't know if it could. When I first started writing the book, I didn't know if they would make it. Um, I took the journey with, with them. And then about three quarters of the way through the book, I realized that, you know, they've got something strong here. And so let's see, um, let's see how we can do some twists and turns and see how they're going to survive. And, you know, a lot of times love does not survive tragedy. Love does not survive infidelity. Um, so, can their love survive? And there are a few times during the writing, I was like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're not going to make it. Maybe they are going to make it. Um, and so, you, you guys will go on that journey too to see really if they're strong enough. So, Brayden is an NFL player. Um, he is your typical, what I would say, romance hero. He's handsome, he only has eyes for her, he's rich. That's your romance hero, right? <laughs> and then, yeah. And then Chanel is a lot like me. She is a no-nonsense businesswoman. She's about getting her coins, and she doesn't let anyone get in the way of that, including her husband. Um, I always ask my readers, are they Team Chanel or Team Brayden? And it's funny, the, the, what I get from readers and feedback. Some of my readers hate Chanel's guts because Brayden is the best thing since sliced bread. I'm like, y'all don't think Brayden's a little bit of a male chauvinist? Because I thought he was kind of a chauvinist sometimes. So when y'all read it, because all of y'all get free copies, so right. that means y'all got y'all got Kiki and y'all got me on your reading list for next month. Right? <laughs> They hit me up on social media and tell me if you were Team Brandon or Team Chanel. Um, because it's funny, like depending on, you know, what a person's life has been like, they'll they'll grab different things out of the book. And that's what I love about hearing from my readers. People will pick up things that I didn't even put there intentionally, but I'm like, wow, that's a takeaway I didn't even put there on purpose, but it spoke to her or it spoke to him in that way. So well, um, Many of our uh, audience here, I asked them prior to you all coming in, what do they like about you both? And the biggest thing I got was that you're relatable. That um, your stories are relatable, um, the situations, you know, that people find themselves in is relatable. And I can, uh, I can identify with that. Um, because I can identify with both the women characters in these books. And while, um, and in more ways than one, which was surprising to me. And I don't even like feeling like that. Like, you know, seeing yourself in a character is kind of crazy, you know? Um, but of course, we all would have responses differently. So uh, before we go to, are we going to have time, a few minutes for the audience to ask questions? I have questions. Okay. Um, I want, I got to get one out. Somebody put pseudo name. You have a pseudo name. Yes, so my um, young adult fiction is under Nikki Carter. Okay, and then you switch and now you're using your name. 
Yeah, so I've used my dad my entire career. Oh, okay. Um, but when I got the uh, book deal from Davina, actually to write young adult fiction, they wanted to separate it from my adult fiction brand because, yeah, because I wrote Christian yeah. fiction. It was very serious. That, that my young sense. adult books were fun and you know hilarious and not at all like what I wrote. So they they definitely didn't want the teenagers to say, "My mama read her. I don't want to read that." <laughs> She'd be crying when she read those books. I don't want to read that. So um, so that's right. And then, had you ever thought about using that sort of thing? I I I did. I was thinking about something unique. And it was only for a spell, like a year or two. Some new stuff. Right, right. Well, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's get.